Hello! I am Teacher QA. I am so excited to teach you our lesson for today. These are our content standard and performance standard in English 9, Quarter 4. At the end of the lesson, students are expected to judge the relevance and worth of ideas, soundness of author's reasoning, and the effectiveness of the presentation. Now let's get started. Module 1 Part 1 Determining the ideas of the author Directions Identify the topics presented in the following excerpts below by choosing the letters of your answers from the set of choices provided. 1. Born in Dublin in 1856 to a middle-class Protestant family bearing pretensions to nobility, Shaw's embarrassing alcoholic father claimed to be descended from Macduff, the slayer of Macbeth. George Bernard Shaw grew to become what some consider the second greatest English playwright, behind only Shakespeare. Others most certainly disagree with such an assessment, but few questioned Shaw's immense talent or the plays that talent produced. Shaw died at the age of 94, a hypochondriac, socialist, anti-vaccinationist, semi-feminist vegetarian who believed in the life force and only wore wool. He left behind him a truly massive corpus of work including about 60 plays, 5 novels, 3 volumes of music criticism, 4 volumes of dance and theatrical criticism, and heaps of social commentary, political theory and voluminous correspondence. A. George Bernard Shaw B. Great English Playwrights C. Macduff D. William Shakespeare The answer is A. George Bernard Shaw 2. Pygmalion is a romance in five acts by George Bernard Shaw produced in German in 1913 in Vienna. It was performed in England in 1914, with Mrs. Patrick Campbell as Eliza Doolittle. The play is a humane comedy about love and the English class system. A. Eliza Doolittle B. English class system C. Mrs. Patrick Campbell D. Pygmalion The answer is D. Pygmalion 3. Henry Higgins, a phonetician, accepts a bet that simply by changing the speech of a cockney flower seller he will be able, in six months, to pass her off as a duchess. Eliza undergoes grueling training. When she successfully passes in high society having in the process become a lovely young woman of sensitivity and taste Higgins dismisses her abruptly as a successfully completed experiment. Eliza, who now belongs neither to the upper class, whose mannerisms and speech she has learned, nor to the lower class, from which she came, rejects his dehumanizing attitude. A. Eliza's poor background B. Eliza's rejection of Henry C. Henry's relationship with Eliza D. Henry's tutelage with Eliza The answer is C. Henry's relationship with Eliza 4. She is not at all a romantic figure. So is she introduced in Act I. Everything about Eliza Doolittle seems to defy any conventional notions we might have about the romantic heroine. When she is transformed from a sassy, smart-mouthed curbstone flower girl with deplorable English, to a, still sassy, 
regal figure fit to consort with nobility, it has less to do with her innate qualities as a heroine than with the fairy tale aspect of the transformation myth itself. A Characterization of Eliza Be Heroines of Romantic Comedies See Plot of Pygmalion D. Unconventional Characters The answer is A. Characterization of Eliza 5. The play became famous as a motion picture in 1938 and later as the stage musical My Fair Lady, 1956, with a musical score by Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowy. A 1964 film version of the musical featured Rex Harrison and Audrey Hepburn. A. Alan J. Lerner B. Audrey Hepburn See My Fair Lady D. Pygmalion The answer is C. My Fair Lady Directions Complete the crossword puzzle Refer to the descriptors on the right as cues to answer the puzzle Vowel letters are already given as cues to answer the puzzle The answers are 1. Supporting 2. Purpose 3. Theme 4. Entertain 5. Informative Directions Read the excerpt Choose the letter of the correct answer for items 1 to 4 Answer item 5 in a complete sentence. New York The most fabulous musical in the history of the stage has been made into a fabulous musical film, one that will be one of the greatest hits in movie history. It is, of course, My Fair Lady, a Warner Brothers presentation, a personal production of Jack L. Warner, and it is a better movie than it was a play. The picture is exquisite, extraordinary, a unique gem of filmmaking. One of those rare, rare occasions when everything goes right, when it keeps going right and it moves and takes the spectator along, enchanted and enthralled. George Cukor's direction is as fresh and crisp as a first night, electric with dramatic tension, keyed high and held. Visually there has never not ever been a motion picture to equal the breathtaking loveliness of My Fair Lady. Technicolor might have been invented for the vivid profusion of color that is splashed on the screen. It is such a pretty picture. But far more is the fact that it is a witty film, an earthy film, with humor that ranges from the sophisticated conversation of George Bernard Shaw at his most recondite to Shaw at his most daring with an assist from Alan J. Lerner. It is tremulous with sentiment and rich with an unusual love story. It has perhaps the most nearly universal of themes. It incarnates the dream of almost everyone, to be bewitched or transmuted in a way to be handsome or beautiful and the beloved of one's idol. 1. Which movie was being described in these paragraphs? A. My Fair Lady B. Romeo and Juliet C. Singing in the Rain D. The King and I 2. Which type of literary text was presented above? A. Description B. Narrative C. Response D. Review 3. What was the author's tone or his attitude toward the film he had watched? A. Bored B. Exhilarated C. Gratified D. Unimpressed The answers are 1. A. My Fair Lady
2. D. Review. 3. C. Gratified. 4. Which of the following statements express the main idea of the three paragraphs? A. George Cukor directed the fabulous musical film. B. The film centered on the unusual love story between a phonetician and his student. C. The film was a fabulous musical film. D. The play was written by George Bernard Shaw. 5. How did the writer compare the film with the play in which it was adapted from? What was the film trying to tell us? The answers are 4. See the film was a fabulous musical film. 5. Answers may vary. In determining the ideas of the author, the following factors must be highly considered. 1. Tone. How was he or she feeling when he wrote the very words he or she had written? 2. Point of view. From which perspective did the author write the text? A. First person point of view. Is the writer speaking for himself slash herself? B. Third person omniscient point of view. Is the writer perceived as a knowledgeable observer seeing everything that happens in his or her writing? C. Third person limited point of view. Is the writer acting both as observer lacking an in depth knowledge about what is happening around him or her? 3. Topic What or who is being written about? 4. Theme or main idea? Which consistent idea, explicit or implicit, does the writer say about the topic? 5. Supporting details. Other than the theme or main idea, what does he or she tell you about the topic? 6. Author purpose and text type. Consider PIE. A. Does the author write to persuade or convince? B. Does he or she give you information about the topic or main idea? C. Does he or she seek to entertain you with his or her writing? Directions On the table provided below are lines taken from the play Pygmalion authored by George Bernard Shaw. Identify the following elements that contribute to your understanding of the main idea as spoken by the characters involved. Character Higgins and Eliza Part of the play Act 1 and Act 5 Excerpts from the play A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift of articulate speech, that your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible, and don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. You see, really and truly, apart from the things anyone can pick up, the dressing and the proper way of speaking, and so on, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves but how she's treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins, because he always treats me as a flower girl, and always will, but I know I can be a lady to you, because you always treat me as a lady, and always will. Characters Tone of the Speech Topic Theme Supporting Details Author's Purpose Here are the answers. 1. Humiliating. 2. Grateful. 3. Expected behaviors from a woman. 4. People's treatment of a woman. 5. A woman must be dignified in speech. 6. 
People must treat women with dignity. 7. A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere no right to live, don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. 8. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins, because he always treats me as a flower girl, and always will, but I know I can be a lady to you, because you always treat me as a lady, and always will. 9. To persuade. 10. To inform. Directions. Fill in the graphic organizer below with the questions you would ask to come up with the main idea or the theme of a writing. Directions. Read the lyrics of the song to answer the following questions. I've grown accustomed to her face. By Alan J. Lerner. Damn. 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 I've grown accustomed to her face. She almost makes the day begin. I've grown accustomed to the tune that. She whistles night and noon. Her smiles, her frowns. Her ups, her downs. Our second nature to me now. Like breathing out and breathing in. I was serenely independent and content before we met. Surely I could always be that way again. And yet. I've grown accustomed to her look. Accustomed to her voice. Accustomed to her face. I can see her now, Mrs. Freddie Ainsford Hill in a wretched little flat above a store. I can see her now, not a penny in the till, and a bill collector beating at the door. She'll try to teach the things I taught her, and end up selling flowers instead, begging for her bread and water, while her husband has his breakfast in bed. In a year, or so, when she's prematurely grey, and the blossom in her cheek has turned to chalk. She'll come home, and lo, he'll have upped and run away. With a social climbing heiress from New York. Poor Eliza. How simply frightful. How humiliating. How delightful. How poignant it'll be on that inevitable night. When she hammers on my door in tears and rags. Miserable and lonely, repentant and contrite. Will I take her in or hurl her to the walls? Give her kindness or the treatment she deserves? Will I take her back or throw the baggage out? But I'm a most forgiving man. The sort who never could, ever would. Take a position and staunchly never budge. A most forgiving man. But, I shall never take her back. If she were even crawling on her knees. Let her promise to atone. Let her shiver, let her moan. I'll slam the door and let the hellcat freeze. But I'm so used to hear her say. Good morning every day. Her joys, her woes. Her highs, her lows. Our second nature to me now like breathing out and breathing in. I'm very grateful she's a woman. And so easy to forget. Rather like a habit. One can always break. And yet. I've grown accustomed to the trace. Of something in the air. Accustomed to her face. 1. Who is speaking in this song? A. Clara B. Eliza C. Higgins D. Pickering 2. Who is the speaker talking about in this song? A. Clara B. Eliza C. Higgins D. Pickering 3. Who do you think is the speaker talking to in this song? 
A. Clara B. Eliza C. Higgins D. Pickering 4. What is the tone of the speaker in this song? A. Comic B. Complex C. Concerned D. Contemptuous The answers are 1. C. Higgins 2. B. Eliza 3. C. Higgins 4. B. Complex 5. What is the underlying theme of this song? A. The song talks about a man's confusion over the change of his flower vendor. B. The song talks about a man's disappointment over the marriage of a friend. C. The song talks about a man's grief after the remarriage of his mother. D. The song talks about a man's longing for a woman he had lost. 6. Which of the following lines support the underlying theme in item 4? A. I'm a most forgiving man, I never could take a position and staunchly never budge b i'm so used to hear her say good morning every day her joys her woes her highs her lows are second nature to me now see mary freddie what an infantile idea what a heartless wicked brainless thing to do but she'll regret it D. She'll try to teach the things I taught her and end up selling flowers instead. The answers are 5. D. The song talks about a man's longing for a woman he had lost. 6. B. I'm so used to hear her say, good morning every day. Her joys, her woes. Her highs, her lows are second nature to me now. 7. Which point of view is utilized in the writing of the lyrics? A. First person point of view. B. Third person limited point of view. C. Second person point of view. D. Third person omniscient point of view. 8. Without looking at the synopsis of the play, in which part does the character sing this song? A. Conflict B. Climax C. Exposition D. Resolution The answers are 7 A. First person point of view 8 D. Resolution 9. What is the purpose of the text presented above? A. To entertain B. To explain C. To inform D. To persuade 10. Which among the following elements will you first look for in determining the main idea of a text? A. Point of view B. Purpose of the author C. Tone D. Topic The answers are 9. B. To explain 10. D. Topic Directions Read the myth entitled Pygmalion and Galatea to answer the following items. A gifted young sculptor of Cyprus, named Pygmalion, was a woman hater. Detesting the faults beyond measure which nature has given to women, he resolved never to marry. His art, he told himself, was enough for him. Nevertheless, the statue he made and devoted all his genius to was that of a woman. Either he could not dismiss what he so disapproved of from his mind as easily as from his life, or else he was bent on forming a perfect woman and showing men the deficiencies of the kind.
they had to put up with. However, that was, he labored long and devotedly on the statue and produced a most exquisite work of art. But lovely as it was, he could not rest content. He kept on working at it and daily under his skillful fingers it grew more beautiful. No woman ever born, no statue ever made, could approach it. When nothing could be added to its perfections, a strange fate had befallen its creator, he had fallen in love, deeply, passionately in love, with the thing he had made. It must be said in explanation that the statue did not look like a statue, no one would have thought it was ivory or stone, but warm human flesh, motionless for a moment only. Such was the wondrous power of this disdainful young man. The supreme achievement of art was his, the art of concealing art. But from that time on, the sex he scorned had their revenge. No hopeless lover of a living maiden was ever so desperately unhappy as Pygmalion. He kissed those enticing lips they could not kiss him back, he caressed her hands, her face they were unresponsive, he took her in his arms she remained a cold and passive form. For a time, he tried to pretend, as children do with their toys. He would dress her in rich robes, trying the effect of one delicate or glowing color after another, and imagined she was pleased. He would bring her the gifts real maidens love, little birds and gay flowers and the shining tears of Amber Phaeton's sisters weep, and then dream that she thanked him with eager affection. He put her to bed at night, and tucked her in all soft and warm, as little girls do their dolls. But he was not a child, he could not keep on pretending. In the end he gave up. He loved a lifeless thing, and he was utterly and hopelessly wretched. This singular passion did not long remain concealed from the goddess of passionate love. Venus was interested in something that seldom came her way, a new kind of lover, and she determined to help a young man who could been amored and yet original. The feast day of Venus was, of course, especially honored in Cyprus, the island which first received the goddess after she rose from the foam. Snow white heifers whose horns had been gilded were offered in numbers to her, the heavenly odor of incense was spread through the island from her many altars, crowds thronged her temples, not an unhappy lover but was there with his gift, praying that his love might turn kind. There too, of course, was Pygmalion. He dared to ask the goddess only that he might find a maiden like his statue, but Venus knew what he really wanted and as a sign that she favored his prayer the flame on the altar he stood before leaped up three times, blazing into the air. Very thoughtful at this good omen Pygmalion sought his house and his love, the thing he had created and given his heart to. There she stood on her pedestal, entrancingly beautiful. He caressed her and then he started back. Was it self-deception or did she really feel warm to his touch? He kissed her lips, a long lingering kiss, and felt them grow soft beneath his. He touched her arms, her shoulders, their hardness vanished. It was like watching wax soften in the sun. He clasped her wrist, blood was pulsing there. Venus, he thought. This is the goddess's doing. And with unutterable gratitude and joy he put his arms around his love and saw her smile into his eyes and blush. 1. Which character in Shaw's Pygmalion was based on the eponymous character? A. Clara. B. Eliza. C. Freddie. D. Higgins. 2. Which character in the said play was based on Galatea? A. Clara. B. Eliza. C. Freddie. 
D. Higgins. 3. Which sentence in the first paragraph contains the main idea of the text? A. First. B. Fourth. C. Second. D. Third. The answers are 1. D. Higgins 2. B. Eliza 3. A. First 4. Which sentence supports the italicized topic sentence on paragraph 3? A. For a time he tried to pretend, as children do with their toys. B. He kissed those enticing lips they could not kiss him back, he caressed her hands, her face they were unresponsive, he took her in his arms she remained a cold and passive form. See he put her to bed at night, and tucked her in all soft and warm, as little girls do their dolls. D he would bring her the gifts real maidens love, little birds, and gay flowers and the shining tears of Amber Phaeton's sisters weep and then dream that she thanked him with eager affection. The answer is B. He kissed those enticing lips they could not kiss him back, he caressed her hands, her face they were unresponsive, he took her in his arms she remained a cold and passive form. 5. Which quote speaks out the message of this myth? A. I think the perfection of love is that it's not perfect. Taylor Swift B. Pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. Aristotle C. Style is the perfection of a point of view. Richard Eberhardt D. The man with insight to admit his limitations comes nearest to perfection. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe The answer is C. Style is the perfection of a point of view. Richard Eberhardt That's all for today. See you in our next lesson. Goodbye.